said we can take questions and, and comments but uh, thanks for having me back here again I was here was it November or uh, yes, November. November for Nestle <laughs> the Nestle program so thank you for having me back again so uh, why uh, why would I write a book about historic snowstorms of central New York well a um, couple of reasons one is I'm a snow lover I, I don't know if I'm in the minority with that with you folks but I do love snow grew up in it grew up in central New York and so it's kind of in my blood I actually lived in Pennsylvania for six years, taught school down there, and I think the whole six years I was there, they, we got 10 inches of snow total, and I just missed home terribly, so I'm, I'm happy here. The other reason is I wrote, the, the second uh, local history book that I wrote was about the blizzard of 66. Uh, so I had a, a whole book of stories about that storm, and uh, so let me start the slideshow, and, and I'll explain why I, decided to write a second book about snowstorms. So I did write that book. That's the title of the book, Voices in the Storm. And I, I, I called it that because most of my history research is uh, people's memories, uh, people's recollections. I like to get the first person story, and then I do my research to make sure that my facts are correct and things like that. Uh, but in, in 2015, I started uh, researching the book, excuse me, 2013, I started researching the book, because I knew in 2016 was going to be the 50th anniversary of the Blizzard of 66, and I thought it would be fun to uh, put, put the book together of people's recollections. I was 10 years old uh, when the Blizzard of 66 hit. I lived in the country outside of Fulton, and I had my own little memories of what that Blizzard was like, and so I just kind of put a feeler out there. Hey, anybody got any memories from the Blizzard of 66? And uh, pardon the pun, I was buried with responses. <laughs> Probably 200, 200 responses from people that made it into this first book. So as I started doing programs about the Blizzard, like I'm doing a program for you tonight, I, was, I did many programs about the Blizzard. 
People were telling me more stories and sending more pictures. Uh, I wanted to show this picture. This is not a Photoshop picture. This is an actual picture from the Blizzard of 66. It actually helped me make the front cover of my Blizzard book. If you cut it right there, that became the front cover. But this photograph was taken by a man named Paul Cardinelli. Some of you may know that name. Paul was a teacher, earth science teacher in Central Square for many, many years. And he studied uh, meteorology in Oswego, Sumi Oswego. That's his friend, Jim. I don't know Jim's last name. But uh, you can see Jim's a full-sized adult. That's the sign, size of that uh, snow drift and after plowing came through. That's Liberty Street in Oswego. If you know the city of Oswego at all, Liberty Street's not far from the lake. But what I love about that picture is that's a little a, a child there. And can you imagine what it must have been like? I mean, I, one of my favorite stories are people that uh, you know, survived these storms as kids and their memories of this. So, so I started getting more pictures. This is from Newark, New York. I love this picture because, and by the way, I, had, I didn't think I had to describe this, but the last time I did my program, the a pro woman raised her hand. She didn't know what that, that's a snowdrift right there. That she didn't know. Um, she said, what is that there? But anyway, I love that picture. Somebody had to stand behind that gentleman with a camera and snap that picture. He opens his garage door and thinks, oh, this is what I have to do to get out of my driveway. That's another picture from the same scene, just a little different angle after he got done shoveling a little bit. You can see the, the height of that drift uh, compared to this car. The other thing I like about this picture is, can you make out the texture of that snow? Um, many people described, I don't remember because I was 10, but you know, the snow, because of those blizzard winds, it jam-packed those snowflake molecules together so tight they became almost concrete-like, right? Many people said they weren't shoveling, they were chiseling to get that snow out. So I, I like that picture for that reason. This uh, next picture, is this is from Sandy Creek area, just another dramatic size. That's a pretty full-sized adult right there. So um, for this particular book, uh, let me go back a step, actually. Um, uh, as I was doing my programs on the Blizzard of 66, people had other stories, but many people said, no, 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 you wrote about the wrong storm. 1958 was the big blizzard. 1947 was the big storm. So that made me curious, how far back in history could I go to collect stories from big snowstorms? So uh, I started diving back. Now, when you get you know, prior to 1930, 1920, there aren't folks alive today that are going to remember that. Maybe they'll remember stories of their grandparents. So I relied a lot on things like newspapers. Okay, uh, I love the old newspapers. If we, I know we have some other researchers and historians in this room, but I love the old newspapers because the reporters back then were almost storytellers. You know, they didn't have photographs, a lot of photographs to, you know, team up with their story. So they really wrote expressively about. Uh, so I got some great uh, snowstorm stories from newspapers. I also read a lot of books about meteorology. I interviewed about 70 uh, people for this new book. The other thing was journals and diaries. A lot of people kept journals and diaries in the old day, right? Maybe you know that, or maybe you, you had in, in the past, but especially farmers who wanted to keep track of when did they plant their crops so they could get ready to plant them again. Folklore, uh, you know, folklore is not, you can't always verify the facts. If I have anything in my book that I couldn't verify, I called it folklore. It was a good story, maybe I wanted to put it in the book, but I didn't want to you know, spread a rumor that wasn't true. Letters, people wrote letters, and meteorological papers. So, um, by the way, I was able to go all the way back to the 1700s in central New York. 1700s. And, you know, Central New York wasn't even a developed community or communities back then, but people came through here. Of course, there were Native American tribes here. So I was able to uh, go that far back. And what I'm going to do now is uh, show you a few uh, pictures and tell you a few of the stories from the book uh, to give you an idea of what kind of things went in there. And one of the things, oh, before we go, uh, let me, it, it's, this is a little unclear, but, and you don't need to see all the small print, but one of my goals for this book is, was I wanted to reach as much of central New York as possible. When I wrote the Blizzard of 66 book, I mostly knew folks from Oswego Fulton area. That's where I had my career and my families. And so I um, 
wanted to really branch out. So I reached out to all the historical societies in central New York and I said, do you have stories of big snowstorms or do you know someone who would be willing to talk to me? And so this is about 100 towns, villages, hamlets of uh, places where I was able to get stories. You can see um, Baldwinsville on the, on the chart there. So, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm skipping ahead of myself. Before we get into the stories, uh, you might recognize this man. This is Jim Teske. Jim is the chief meteorologist for News Channel 9. And so the first chapter of my book, I wanted to describe lake effect snow, the phenomenon of lake effect snow. So I did my research in, on meteorology and, and the Great Lakes and, and lake effect. And I wanted someone knowledgeable to read my text to make sure that it was accurate. So I just emailed Jim. I didn't know him, but I emailed him. Right away he got back to me, sure, send me the chapter. Great guy, uh, loves snow. Uh, and so he also told me his story of growing up in a small uh, suburb of Syracuse called Fremont. I don't know if anybody's heard of Fremont, but uh, he told, so he, he made it into my book because I have his story about how he fell in love with snow uh, many years ago. So one of the things I've realized from writing my local history books is my books sometimes leave central New York. You know, if somebody reads a book and they like it, they'll send it to their brother or sister in California or Texas, something like that. So I realized if I'm going to write about lake effect snowstorms in central New York, I really need to, you know, anchor the reader into central New York. So uh, the first part of the chapter talks about the phenomenon of lake effect snow. Here we are in central New York, way over here. And you may know, already know this, but you know, folks who don't live around here wouldn't necessarily know that when those westerly, northwesterly winds come in like they often do, they sweep across those great lakes. And look where they, they end up, the very end, right here where we live in central New York. So we actually get, we get most of our lake effect, obviously, from Lake Ontario, but we get snow from Lake Erie, and sometimes all the Great Lakes will contribute to our snowfall. As I was doing my research, um, I kept having this image in my mind of a single snowflake. You know, I was reading about the phenomenon of the, the cycle of the snow, right? It st starts off as a, if it's lake effect snow, it starts off as a drop of water in a lake, and then, you know, uh, it vaporizes and goes up to the clouds, and then you know, eventually comes down to snowflakes. And I wanted to tell the story of lake effect snow, but I'm a storyteller and I didn't want to just put down the cold hard facts. So I decided to tell a story through the voice of a single snowflake, okay? And by the way, uh, most of us think of our snowflakes as just like we see here, you know, six pronged, very pretty. But here's a lake effect snowflake. <laughs> well, actually, there's many. These are several lake effect snowflakes. This was also a, a Paul Cardinelli photograph that he sent me. Uh, this one here, he says, about one inch in, in diameter, diameter, no, excuse me, uh, length. So one inch, that's pretty big. And you've probably seen those big snowflakes if you've been out in the weather. What happens is the smaller snowflakes, as they come down, it's called uh, branching. They'll, they'll connect with one another and expand, and that's how they get so big. So what I did, because I wanted to tell the story through the voice, I gave my snowflake a name. Where's my button? So it's the story of Terry in honor of Lake Ontario, uh, a lake effect snowflake. And I kind of go through the whole system, uh, the whole water cycle, which I had a lot of fun doing. So that's the opening chapter of the book. Now we can get into the stories. So I did mention I went back to 1700s. My first story was actually from the 1720s. Um, but that was not somebody settled in Central America. It was actually a European traveler, uh, explorer, who came through this area. And he wrote in his journal about this massive snowstorm that he had. And he'd never seen anything like it before. And I figured that had to have been a lake effect snowstorm. So I just talked a little bit about that. But the first major story I had is this gentleman you see here is Colonel Marius Willett. And Colonel Willett. Uh, fought in the Revolutionary War under General George Washington. And near the end of the war, we're in 1783 now, so it's very near the end of the Revolutionary War, Colonel Willett was stationed in uh, Fort Herkimer in Oneida County, which is in the Herkimer area. I don't believe it's called Fort Herkimer anymore. I think it's Fort Stanwood, maybe. But um, at the time, uh, 
General Washington, General George Washington, soon to become our first president, ordered Colonel Willett to march his men from Fort Herkimer to Oswego, New York, to Fort Oswego. Okay, now you notice I didn't say Fort Ontario. There were actually two forts in Oswego back in the 1700s and 1800s, um, and one of them was called Fort Oswego. And this postcard is a depiction of that era of when the fort was there. Now, why would General Washington want Colonel Willett to march his men to Oswego? Uh, Fort Oswego was controlled by the British, and General Washington wanted to overtake them, take control of the fort so that he would have control of boats coming in and out of the river in, in the Lake Ontario era. So we have this story of Colonel Willett marching 100 men, about, no, excuse me, 200 men, uh, 100 miles, uh, Many of them black. Is that right? Yes. You know the story then? Yes. Okay, well, maybe you can fill it in a little more than I do. But no, so you're I, free. I think that's so very interesting about that particular expedition. That many of them were black. Yeah. Many of them yeah. were black, and some of them came back and settled here. Is that right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, so he marched those men 100 miles. This is February of 1783. Okay, probably not the best month to be marching. Oneida Lake was frozen, they marched across the lake, and then came near to the Oswego era, area, and Colonel Willett uh, realized that he needed some help to get to Oswego. They found a Native American guide who knew the area very well, and uh, I don't want to say hired him, but brought him on, the Native American, to guide them to Oswego. They get within four miles of Oswego, and guess what happened? A snowstorm. They had a lake effect snowstorm. And uh, Colonel Willett and his men stopped. The Native American guide stopped. The Native American guide didn't go any farther. And uh, Colonel Willett asked him why. He said, I don't know where I am. So this is somebody who had grown and born and raised here and grown in lake effect snow. We'll do that too. You've been out in those storms, right? When you're driving and you sort of What lose. did he say? I'm sorry. Uh, the Native American guide said, I don't know where I am. Oh. He was okay. lost because okay. of the lake effect snow. Unfortunately, uh, Colonel Willett had to make a decision. They wanted to surprise the British in the middle of the night uh, and overtake the, uh, the, the fort. And uh, with the lake effect snow, they were stopped. Colonel Willett had to make a decision. Do we wait one more day and try tomorrow night or go back? Well, his men by that point were starting to get frostbitten. They'd run out of food. They couldn't start a fire because that would draw attention to them, and they were trying to be in secret. They ended up turning around and walking all the way back. So an unfortunate ending. But I, So I start the book with that story because it shows the power. That, st that storm, like a thick storm, affected you know, our history of, of the beginning of the United States. From here, I go to uh, 1816. Uh, the year without a summer. Some of you may be familiar with this phenomenon. I wasn't until I did my research. And what we're seeing here is an artist's rendition of uh, what happened in 1815. A volcano in Indonesia uh, erupted and it spewed ash throughout the atmosphere. And it made this cloud throughout much of the world. And that's what we're seeing in this, in this uh, picture. And uh, people were unable to grow crops that year. Now, why do I put this in my book about Central New York? Because I was able to uncover a diary from a farming family in Sterling, New York, that lived through this year. And the woman who wrote in the diary had, uh, it was beautifully written because the dates were in there. You know, frost in August, snow in June. I mean, they literally could not grow crops that year. People, of course, were in danger of uh, perishing. So it's a pretty dramatic story. I also wanted to have at least one story in my book about how snowstorms affect boats on the lake. Uh, this picture does not match the story that's in my book, but I think it illustrates what I want, want to explain here. And by the way, uh, this story came from a woman named Susan Peterson Gately. I don't know if anybody knows that name. Susan is a historian and a writer from Fairhaven, and she specializes in Lake Ontario stories and uh, ship stories. And so, with her permission, I borrowed one of the stories from her book because it was a storm that took place in November in 1880. And again, this picture doesn't um, match exactly, but that is Lake Ontario, by the way, and that is ice on the lake. So it's pretty close to 
This uh, ship was trying to come into the Oswego Harbor and got hit with a lake effect storm that lined them. It pushed them off, sh off the, the course and ended up crashing on the, on the shore. Thankfully, nobody perished, but the ship was no longer used again. By the way, Susan uh, estimates, let me see if I get the right figure here, that uh, there are about 230 ships at the bottom of Lake Ontario that have uh, uh, sunk because of storms. And a plane. And what? In a plane? Yeah. Oh, really? Uh, from a snowstorm, was it? Or? Uh, not from a snowstorm, but. So, in one airplane. Yep. Huh. So, we get a lot of snow in Central New York, right? Um, <laughs> this is from Tug Hill area, and there you saw all that snow. But one of the things that uh, impressed me, and impressed me when I wrote The Village of the Voices in the Storm, the Blizzard of 66 book, but it also impressed me when I was writing this book, were about the snow cloud drivers. Okay, the people that braved the storms. Uh, you know, I'm from Oswego County, and I was told that during the blizzard of 66, they really only pulled the plows during that real intense, I think it was Sunday night into Monday morning during that blizzard. Most of the rest of the time, the plows were out there trying to keep those roads open. But what impressed me especially about this particular uh, book was the type of snow plows back in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, they really weren't much more than trucks, you know, sort of people's regular trucks. And they got stuck uh, more than they didn't get stuck. This, this picture is from Mexico, Scenic Avenue. If you know Mexico at all, that's Scenic Avenue. Uh, this guy's just plain stuck here. This is from the Richland area. So uh, as I was doing my research, as I said, I, I reached out to a lot of the historical societies in the area. And Oneida County was very helpful with stories from their, uh, from their region. And uh, the historian there said, have you seen the uh, snowplow video that's on YouTube from Oneida County? And I said, no, he sent me a link to it. And it's a fascinating uh, 22 minutes of uh, snowplows during the 1947, which was a major snowstorm in this area. Now, uh, with his permission, I'm going to show you two minutes of that, 22 minutes, because I thought I'd like to share it with you. There's two things I want to explain. What you're going to see is, you'll see in the center the, uh, the video. In the right-hand corner, you're going to see a man who's narrating it. And this was done, he did a program for Oneida County. The man that we're listening to is the son of the father, or the, the son of the person who's driving the snowplow that we're going to see. So he's got some emotional attachment to it. So we're going to listen to him for a couple of minutes. And, uh, and just uh, here, the other thing is we're going to see real snowstorm here. You don't see a lot of pictures of snowstorms and blizzards because people don't usually venture out. But snowplow drivers had to be out here. So here we go. We're going to see if we can get this to work. This is a storm of 47. OK, can you hear that? We're going to start again, folks. Just a second. Probably 10 folks in the snow in there. That been flooded for two weeks. This is the storm of 47. You didn't have to back up with that man. She pushed straight through. You didn't need any heat in there either. To, the guy driving at the swamp would be rolling right off of him, right in shirt sleeves. This is out on the West Milan Road. This is 47. The last year we plowed, uh, we had a pretty bad storm there. This was the first road carry that the Nida County had, the first road we plowed. It didn't work out good because those paddles would break off. They'd go off the chute and be like a, sending a missile out. <laughs> this was out by O'Brien Road on the West Line Road. This was the first, first rotary the county had. That bar's all gone now. It was strong and pretty good that day. I don't know if any of you remember the storm of 47, but it started snowing the 1st of March, the ground repair. Snowed for two weeks, 
steady, right there. And it's small. It was heavy. And then point everything. They had the airdrop uh, food people. And she just couldn't move them the road for blood. Okay. Okay. Uh, that's about it. still down on the Westland Road. There we go. So um, the other thing, if you want, if you're interested in seeing the whole 22 minutes, ask me at the end of the program, and I'll uh, get you the link. But one of the things I liked about what he said later in the program was he said sometimes you know snowplows hit mailboxes. It happens now and then, and when that happens and the mailbox goes flying, they call that air mail. <laughs> <laughs> now was that all the storm of 47? Yes. Okay. That was all 1947. Okay. Yeah. Two weeks he said it's, it snowed straight there. And the other thing you mentioned that was March. We're still in March, so it's not too late to get a big snowstorm here, is it, folks? <laughs> Nobody March wants to talk about 47? that. 1947. March? March of 19... It started? Oh. Yep, that's when it started. Wow, yeah. okay. So um, here's another snowplow. Uh, this is uh, 1945, again, Oneida County. And, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's the problem with... You know, those, those smaller plows, I mean, that's a road. This guy's on a road, and it was so narrow that he got stuck in there. He had to get shoveled out or pulled out, I'm not sure. So uh, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to quickly go through a few more stories, but I'm going to do it in forms of headlines. And why headlines? Well, when you do a lot of research with newspapers and you go to sleep at night, you start seeing headlines in your head. I mean, <laughs> so I thought it'd be fun to put these in headlines. So I'm going to show you a picture and give you a headline. The picture doesn't always exactly match the story, but I use it for illustration, and I'll explain which ones are real and, or, not, or which ones match and which ones. This story does not match the picture, but you'll see why I show it when I tell you the story or give you the headline. So here we go, February 1945, Cassville, Oneida County. School bus lodged between snowbanks. Children trapped. Just imagine. I, I interviewed a woman who was not one of the children on that bus. And it was just like you've seen in that picture, only it was a school bus. They just, it got stuck and it couldn't move. They, they were there for several hours in that bus. They all got out, everybody was fine, but that's scary, uh, especially when you're a child. January 1925, Syracuse, record-breaking snow collapses roofs, SU students hired to shovel. Now, again, this is from Redfield. This is not SU, uh, but I thought the picture uh, sort of illustrates the, the headline. There's the plow there, if you could see the blade right up there, right? And I guess the snow shovelers are going to somehow loosen that up so he can get out of there. But uh, I imagine those SU students loved having the day after class, too. They got paid to shovel. I have some stories from Fairhaven, New York, uh, at the State Park. And uh, this is uh, Harold Northrop, and I'm sorry, I don't, and I don't have his wife's name, but they were the supervisors uh, from 1938 to 1963. Uh, it's a long period of time when that uh, beach park was be being developed. And he had some amazing stories of storms that he saw coming off that lake. But the story that I'm going to tell you briefly now is right before he got there. Here we go, December, January, 1935 to 36, Fairhaven State Park Civilian Conservation Corps comes to the village's rescue. So may, maybe some of you are familiar with the CCC. That was a program Franklin Delano Roosevelt put, used to put people back to work after the Depression. There were 200 men stationed at Fairhaven in 1935. I can't imagine there were buildings then. They must have been lean-tos or, or something like that. But they lived there year-round. And this story, and this is an actual picture, this picture does match the story. Uh, these, uh, the village of Fairhaven run, had, was running out of food uh, because of the, they couldn't get trucks in with food. So they, the crew used this, I think they called it a crawler, which you get through snow. Behind it is a toboggan. And a group of the men went to the next village over Red Creek and bought food and brought it back uh, so that the village, villagers would have something to eat. The guy sitting on top of the crawler his job, he had a flashlight. And because they were traveling in the dark on the way back, he had to try to flash in front of them so they could see where they were going. Pretty dramatic rescue. Uh, this picture doesn't match exactly, but I think it's pretty close. 
February 1958, Sterling, only three school days in February, a girl views plow from the top of the power pole. So this story came from a woman named Pat Cooper, if anybody happens to know Pat, from, she's from Fairhaven. And she told me she, she uh, was upset there were only three school days. And when I asked her why, she said, because I was studying for my regents and I wanted to get to school. I bet you she was the only kid that was complaining about that. <laughs> um, but she did say that uh, she was sitting on top of the telephone pole to watch when the plows came through. Oh, I sort of ruined my joke, but I, I'll leave this up here. Um, I, most businesses probably were unhappy with the amount of snow that we get with our big storms, but some people actually kind of liked it. Like, this is a guy, he works for the phone company. He didn't need a ladder to get up to the top of the pole, <laughs> just climb the snow pit. That's from Mex Mexico, New York, picture, by the way. This picture does match the story. December 1958, Oswego. Mayor needs dog sled to survey snowbound city. So that is the mayor of Oswego in 1958 behind the dog sled, and those are Alaskan huskies pulling him. So I got this story from a man named Mark Slozik. You might, some of you might know Mark is the city of Oswego historian. Mark was a youth about 10 or 12 years old when this storm hit. He was delivering newspapers the flagging time. He went downtown to uh, pick up the newspapers to deliver, and he sees this dog sled going by. He thought he was in another world or something. <laughs> April 1975, Fayetteville, five-year-old trapped in well, rescued by dog. Every book needs a good dog story, don't you think? <laughs> and this picture doesn't match the story, but I thought the innocence of the child in the picture. So look at the date, April 1975. That's late for a snowstorm, but what had happened that year was uh, heavy rains in the spring, and then a cold front came through. A bunch of snow, it collapsed the well. A girl and her friend were playing, the girl fell down the well. And this dog, I don't know, this sounds like Lassie. The dog knew something was wrong. He got somebody out over there and got the girl rescued. So has a happy ending. January 1976, Adams, town and running for snowiest place in America. So this picture doesn't match the story, but the, the, the person there is measuring snow, so I used this. Um, Adams thought they had the record for 24-hour snowfall in, in this January 76 storm. 68 inches fell in 24 hours. They thought they had the record, uh, but a place in Colorado beat them like one inch. So they weren't too happy about that. I like this picture. It came from, um, I had the honor and the privilege of writing the biography of a man named Bob Sykes. Some of you might remember that name. He was a meteorologist and a weather reporter from Oswego. And uh, Bob Sykes taught a lot of famous people, Al Roker, Dave Eichhorn, uh, other people uh, from, that are you know, known for their weather keeping. He taught them, and, and Bob believed that he should teach his students immersed in the weather. So he would take his students out into the storm. That's, this is a picture of one of his students measuring snow for him. So I, I like using that picture. So I want to uh, ask a question here. Uh, I stopped my book chronologically. So I started it in the 1700s. I stopped at the end of the 1970s. Why? Anybody want to take a guess why I stopped the book at the end of the 1970s? Just a guess, anyone? You moved to Florida. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. no. Uh, I'll, okay, I'll, I'll just tell you. Um, I wasn't getting good stories after 19, the end 1980s. Um, and let's think about it. You know, in the 80s and the early 90s, cell phones came, internet, Doppler, the Weather Channel. You know, how we see our weather and how we deal with our weather has changed dramatically since the 1970s and prior to that. You know, if you were stuck out in the weather in the 1950s or 60s, you were stuck out in that weather and you hoped you found your way back. So um, I stopped at the end of the 70s, which if those of you that are old enough to remember, that was a very snowy decade here. Seven, we had several years of major snow. So remember I told you that people kept telling me stories about the blizzard of 66. I uh, had collected those stories over the years. I got about 100 stories, and I figured out 
Let me use the last chapter of this new book. I'm going to go back to the blizzard of 66 and tell the stories. Now, one of the first stories I tell was given to me by Jim Cronbeck. Am I saying that last name right, Jim? Yeah. Jim Cronbeck uh, stood up at a program and said, I got a story for you. And, uh, and Jim's, so the, Jim's story made it into the new book. And I'll let you, if you find yourself with the book, uh, you'll read Jim's story. But what I'm going to do real quickly now, and then we'll finish up, is I'm going to quickly go through some headlines from the stories. I took about 30 stories that make the last chapter of the book. So here's a few of them, and I'll briefly tell you what each one's about. Nurse from New Haven hops a snowmobile to make her shift in Oswego. So I love, you know, nurses, there's some dedicated nurses, you know, they, they know that they're needed. This woman was not going to be able to make it in by her automobile from New Haven to Oswego, which is, you're probably familiar with New Haven. It's maybe eight or 10 miles from the city of Oswego. Um, so she found a neighbor with a snowmobile, hopped it. He went as far as um, Scriba. So he was about three miles left to go. She found a guy with a Jeep, and he gave her a ride the rest of the way in, but the Jeep had no floor in it. So it was, pretty, it was a pretty exciting ride. Cato School's maintenance man drives unplowed roads to Pennsylvania for coal. So this is a story I found in the newspaper. You know, the school's closed but they still had to heat those buildings or they lose their uh, pipes would freeze. So uh, this gentleman used to drive an 18 wheeler down periodically and pick up coal for the school. And he called down there and they said, you'll never make it down here with an 18 wheeler. So he found a smaller truck, made it down there and got back. So he was kind of hero of the school. So I put the story in. Well, I got a little extra bonus. I'm telling this, I'm doing a program in, in uh, Sterling and I tell this story, and a man raises his hand and said, that was me. <laughs> so I got to meet him in person. And thankfully, I spelled his name right in the book, so that was good. So he had an interesting story about uh, his details for that. Fulton Team carries food from his father's diner to the family home. So I'm from Fulton. If you, anybody remember the green and white diner in Fulton? Mm -hmm. There's a little small diner right by uh, Lower Bridge by the river. Uh, here's the story briefly. Uh, the fathers and the family were trapped in their home outside of Fulton, about four, four miles from the diner, and they were running out of food. The, the teenage son was in the city, must have been visiting a friend and got trapped in the city. So the father called and said, you need to go to the diner to get food and carry it out to us, to our home. And the story of how this, first of all, the teen has to break into the diner, he doesn't have a set of keys. <laughs> and then gets the food and carries it up home for his family. It's a pretty dramatic story. <laughs> Sandy Creek Boy describes total amazement after blizzard. So I mentioned earlier, I love hearing stories from who, people who are adults now but were children during the storms because, you know, if you're young and you see these amazing storms, well, he used the word total amazement or the phrase total amazement. So I liked including that in the book. Camillage college student breaks leg skiing, watches blizzard from hospital bed. So, you know, I asked myself, why was she skiing during the blizzard? Well, she was a college student, so. Uh, but um, she, just, she, was, she was in the Watertown area skiing. They took her to the Watertown hospital. She had a friend with her who was driving her, so the two of them ended up staying in the hospital for several days. The friend, um, they didn't have any extra clothes, so they had to wear hospital gowns or whatever. The friend had to put masking tape on her gown that said, I'm not a patient. They didn't want to wake her up in the middle of the night. But one of the most dramatic parts of the story was they, they said, or the woman told me that as that storm continued and that snow inched up the window, they saw a diagonal uh, crack in that window. That's the pressure of the snow coming in, so pretty scary. Wayne County woman's heading, woman heading for SUNY Oswego Braves blizzard in 1958 Chevy. So I just like this uh, story for a lot of reasons. You know, Martha, you mentioned uh, being dark. And you know, during the, most of the winter, especially during these storms, it's pitch dark most of the day. And this woman drove by herself through the back roads. This was before Route 104 was even built. And uh, that Chevy was a stick shift. She said she drove in second gear all the way to, to, to Oswego, but she made it. Oswego County ham radio operators send relief to rural residents. One of the things I learned uh, from doing my research is ham radio operators, I always consider that a hobby, something you did in your cellar or your, your den for fun. But 
These folks were heroes during these blizzards and blizzard of 66. Think about before internet and cell phone, if you were uh, in the country and you were closed in and you needed food or insulin, some kind of medicine, how are you gonna get that? Well, neighbors that were ham radio operators were able to relay messages to the police and to the uh, pharmacies to get people what they needed. Pregnant Liverpool woman hitchhikes to Fulton during blizzard to reunite with family. <laughs> so in defense of this woman, I'm gonna explain the story because that seems pretty weird, but. Uh, here's how I learned this story. The woman's in-laws worked at Nestle, so when I was researching the Nestle book, which came after the Blizzard of 66 book, she met with me to show me the memorabilia she had, and she told me some stories. She goes, by the way, I heard you wrote a book about the Blizzard of 66. And I said, yes, yeah. because I got a story for you. So here's her story. She was six months pregnant, uh, and she and her husband dropped their two-year-old off in Fulton, uh, because they were going to go back to Liverpool to attend a party, spend the night, and then go the, the next day they were going to go back and pick up their daughter. And then the blizzard hit during the party. She woke up the next day, and um, you know, I'm sure there's mothers in the group, maybe, or, or fathers or parents in general. Um, when she woke up and realized she was going to be separated from her daughter, she couldn't live with it. She said, I can't be away from my daughter that long. So she said to her husband, we're going to hitchhike to Fulton, and that's what they did. So she was, uh, she made it fine. The baby was born three months later, fine. But pretty ba brave woman, maybe brave. I don't know what, what a word I used to describe. Uh, here's another uh, pregnancy story, but this one: a Swico veterinarian travels during blizzard to help dog delivers pups. It's a good, it's a good feel-good story. Uh, the dog, by the way, was in such distress it would not have survived if the veterinarian hadn't got there. But got there in time through the blizzard to deliver the pups. 12-year-old Cicero boy caught in Blizzard's mini tornado. Now, there were not uh, tornadoes in Blizzard, but there were 60 mile an hour winds, and sometimes when those winds got in between buildings or whatever, they'd circulate around and felt like a tornado. This boy was outside during the Blizzard shoveling his driveway. I think maybe his dad had had enough of him being in the house and said, get out, you're gonna <laughs> shovel or whatever, but he got caught in what felt like a tornado. And the way he described that, he, he panicked and uh, really had some stressful situations he had to get through, but he, he made it through OK. This is the last story in the book, and uh, this is how I'm going to end my program tonight. I was doing a program uh, just like, uh, actually, Jim, you, you might have been there that night. You and Nancy might have been there. I think, I think when I met you, was it the program in Fulton that you attended? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you remember this man standing up. Uh, he was obviously much older than in the yeah. picture, but do you remember this? So he, yeah. uh, this man uh, was from town of Oswego, and he was stationed in Okinawa, Japan during the blizzard of 66. And he said he had a day off, went down to the commissary, and he was going to try to get a snack and find an American newspaper and just catch up on news. And he, and he saw a headline in a photograph of an Ameri a United States newspaper that, uh, from Oswego, New York, uh, from the Blizzard of 66, and he said to his buddies, that's where I'm from, and you know, his buddies thought he was making it up or whatever, yeah. but he said, I wish I kept a copy of that newspaper because that was my hometown that was on the front page. So he and I exchanged email addresses, and three or four months later, sure enough, I get an email, and he found the newspaper. <laughs> and there it is, Stars and Stripes. You may be familiar with it uh, if you have military in your family, but it's a was a military newspaper that kept uh, people overseas informed on American uh, news. Now look at the date, uh, Friday, February 4th. The blizzard of 66 was late January, very early February storm. And there it is, a Oswego, New York, on the front page photograph. So I end the book because I talk about, you know, our central New York storms are world famous. You know, Walter Cronkite talked about it on the evening news one night. Johnny Carson joked about it on The Tonight Show back during the 70s. So to me, I think our snowstorms are something to be proud of. I don't know if you folks would agree with me, but uh, that's, that's the way I feel. So let me just show one more picture. This is the front cover of the book. And uh, I, my first three books I self-publish. And when you self-publish, you control everything, title, cover. But when you work for a publishing company, with a publishing company, which I have for the last three books, you hope, uh, you send them suggestions, but they pick the front cover, photo, and title. I thought they did a good job on this. 
By the way, I work with a company called Arcadia, the History Press, so they're, they're a wonderful company to work with. This picture is uh, from the 1947 storm, and this is town of Oswego, Perry Hill. I don't know if you know Perry Hill. It's, if you are at the college or near the fish stands out there, it's one of those big hills that go on 104. And it's from the 1947 storm. That plow is stuck. That plow is somehow supposed to get through that snow drift and, and open that Route 104 is what that is. And those two snow shovelers are going to save them, I guess. So, <laughs> well, uh, that's my story. And I want to thank you very much for uh, being a great audience tonight. We put the lights up and then um, I can take questions or comments or you know a story or two from, from folks. Can you tell me what is the black being those beyond the Those are trees. Oh that's trees? Those are trees, yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you, because somebody asked that before and I forgot to point that out. Those okay. are trees. Yes. <laughs> Jim, do you remember who contributed your Baldwinsville story for the book? Or what it was about? Boy. Oh, I don't. Did it involve snow? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm sorry, I don't remember. There's probably a couple of different problems. Well, we'll have to buy a book. And <laughs> not necessarily, but. Yeah. Anybody else have comments or questions? or? So, how many of us were here in Baldwinsville or close by, you know, during the storm? Yeah. yeah, I was in high school. We lived in Plainville. I was in high school. We were out of school for a week. We didn't see a plow for almost a week. Yeah. And I think the only reason we saw it is because someone had a heart attack and needed to go to the hospital. Yeah. And that's the only reason a plow came all the way out there. Wow. Yeah. Otherwise, we'd probably still be sitting there. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it was amazing. I mean, what we expect of our snow plow drivers has changed so much, so dramatically. Can you imagine now being a week without a plow coming through? People wouldn't put up with it, I guess. Oh, but. Yeah. Back then, we didn't have the equipment, or it was uh, lesser quality equipment, or smaller equipment. So, yeah, two, it, wasn't, it wasn't unusual in the rural areas. Two weeks, sometimes, people would have been trapped in their homes. I remember a lot of the lines of that. I was in junior high, I guess, just starting high school at that time. And I remember the snow after the plows finally started coming. I remember it wasn't an exaggeration that the it was heaped up that high on the side of the road. And I remember when my parents finally got the one front doors open, we could edge our way out of the storm door. One of us had to get up on the drifts and crawl to our neighbor's house. Wow. Crawl to our neighbor's house to get milk or something. And milk, I think we needed. Yeah. yeah, it was crazy, but I remember that. We were out of school for a while. Yeah, Very definitely true. Uh, rural Baldwinsville, you know, we were out there, so. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for your story. Yeah. yeah. Anybody else? Jim. Well, one of the interesting aftermaths I found, I grew up in Phoenix, and when they were able to plow State Street, which is the main business district, they actually plowed it backwards to keep from just inundating all the storefronts mm -hmm. they plowed it backwards mm -hmm. so that there were two lanes to drive down but there was probably a 15 foot bank down the middle of the street that they spent probably a month removing with loaders and, and dump trucks and whatnot yeah, yeah. <laughs> but if you think days. about it you've got the street you've got a narrow sidewalk and then the storefronts mm -hmm. and so yeah the fact that they did it that way helped to that was thoughtful, get stores that was open. And, yeah, yeah. That's, that was thoughtful, and I'm not sure all communities did that. I, I don't know about others, but that's the way they did it there. About that. In fact, I've seen some pictures of Oswego that look pretty, those sidewalks look pretty dumped down by the snow plows, so thank you. Yes? If you're familiar with Route 48, before you reach Bright Corner and the railroad path, there was a gentleman by the name of Charlie Carpenter, and he built a rotary snowplow. And as a kid, I grew up in Baldwinville, he had it parked in the front of his garage. <laughs> this is in the 30s. Wow. Yeah. He, he just built it from uh, I don't know. his imagination? Or? Yeah, he was an inventive individual. Yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful. Barb? I have pictures, 
in Phoenix, of the same street he's talking about, really? of the plow plowing the trolley tracks. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And having people out there, like the, your picture with them shoveling, shoveling so that the plow could finally break through the yeah. snow. Right. So that was, that was another problem, totally different than our roads. But the mm -hmm. trolleys and the trains. Yes. Yeah, um, I, I found several stories about trains, the problems they had with the trains. In fact, um, some of the stories from the, I think it was the 20s and the 30s, you know, the city, well, say DPW, whatever they call the people that were responsible for cleaning the streets, they were angry about automobiles because that was a new thing they had to deal with when they were trying to clean, you know, clean the area was these automobiles that probably got stuck in the middle of the street. Yes, sir. The wind was so strong that the back of her house, the stone out of almost two thirds way up the dining room window. And I have a picture of a tunnel we dug with a German shepherd coming out of the tunnel. <laughs> 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 she was in. That's very Another thing after the blizzard, my kids were still in school. And so it's like 96, in the 90s somewhere, I don't remember. But there was a van, we lived on Cottage Road just near the, the mm -hmm. park entrance, and the Van Buren Town plow got stuck coming down the hill. Yeah. So when the plow gets stuck, you're really in trouble. Yeah, yeah we knew we were in trouble. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, the plow came full and, you know, gave him a push and got him out of there. <laughs> Your dog story reminded me, remind me of one of the stories I enjoyed was, um, family had a dog, and the dog was in the dog house, which normally in the winter wasn't a big problem, right? Because, you know, coming out. But during the blizzard, that dog was stuck in there for a few days, so the little boy got worried and, you know, shoveled, shoveled, shoveled to get the dog out. As soon as the dog came out, he ran to go relieve himself because, you know, he was taught not to do his business in the dog house, so that poor dog had to wait a couple days. I had a question about, um Farm animals, did did you ever hear about people losing a quantity of, of farm animals that weren't able to, to move or get fed or I, I, yeah, I heard some stories. I don't think there are any in the book on that, but yeah. I know I have a story about somebody airlifting chicken feed mm -hmm. to a farm somewhere. They they had helicoptered in because they couldn't get chicken feed in and then you know the chickens were gonna yeah. Yeah. So that, I mean, it was a happy ending story because they yeah. were Are you re referring to 66? Yeah. Well, the, I knew on Fairy Road, yeah. and there was a chicken farm in Jack's Reef that all the chickens died. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah I just wondered about that, like, with, even with the bigger livestock, you know, mm -hmm. pigs and cattle and stuff. But can't, there had to be some loss of life with not being able to even get access to yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Jim, I, I was about 13, and I lived on 57. Uh -huh. And in 66, Fulton Hospital was the hospital he went to. Mm. And you didn't realize how quiet and how silent it was. Living on Route 57, you know, there was always traffic. Mm. Mm. It was the main road. There was no 481. There were, you know, and so there was always traffic. It was silent, except they had to break that road and clean it to get so ambulances could get to Fulton Hospital. People in Phoenix didn't go to Syracuse to the hospital. They went to Fulton. Sure, yeah. You know, um, yeah. I'm sure there were some instances that people went to Syracuse, mm -hmm. but, um, and you could just it lay in bed and, and in silence, just hear the snow plow. We didn't know where it was pounding, mm -hmm. but the V plows were just pounding. Pound yeah. to try to get through the snow. I've heard the stories about they, they maybe make a couple of feet. Yes, and back, back up, up and do it again. And do it again. Yeah. And hearing that over and over. They didn't again. just drive through it because yeah. I, I oh, can remember yeah. hearing the pounding. Yeah. Well, that was that snow I talked about. I remember how it got concrete like. Yeah. I mean, they, they yeah. it, it was a wall. Yeah. 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 And by the way, the woman that hitchhiked pregnant was on 57. She said it was right on. <laughs> That was the main drag. Yeah, it, it was the road. It's, there was no other road. It was on the other side of the river, then you went on 48. 48, yeah. Thank you. Sir? Uh, I was in high school in 66, and it seemed to me that uh, we had uh, one of the students, I might not have been in this particular storm, uh, uh, in the middle of the storm, this, this young guy 
uh, walked a couple miles uh, to, to his girlfriend's house. He never quite made it. That's right. And was, was, that, was that, yes. that the big that, storm? It was 66. That, that's yes. in my blizzard book. Mm. Yeah, so yes. very sad. Mm. Very sad. Yeah, he, he got disoriented. I think they found his body two miles in the opposite direction he should have been walking because he was so disoriented in that. You was it somewhere like Hayes yeah. Road or Hicks Road, somewhere out that way? It was out 370, yeah. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. Very sad, yeah. I had a similar story that my former boss told me about the same situation. The guy missed his girlfriend, and he walked through farm country. This was in Tully, New York. And he he got lost, but uh, I, don't, I don't So the, my boss lived on a farm, and this boy that was walking was friends with the brother of, of her and he hit the barn of this woman. He didn't see it. He ran into it, and then he knew where he was so he could get to the house and get out. Otherwise, he would have perished too. Let's not end with a negative story. No. <laughs> Sunday morning wasn't snowing that day, and I was heading for Manoa, from Aldersville. Okay. Or I got there. And I was stuck at my mother-in-law's for two days. <laughs> I didn't get back to Aldersville until Tuesday. <laughs> oh, if I do another book, if I do another book, you're going to be in the book. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. So, thank you. So thank my you. books are here. They're, How uh, much are they? So, uh, are they all the same? They're not all the same. The, the new book is $20. Um, the others are, uh, Nestle's is 20 This is 20 And then these two are 15 Oh, okay. 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 Uh, thanks so much for having me here. Sit around if you want to just uh, tell me a story or whatever. Okay, and don't forget our next.